And we are live. Welcome. And that's uh, my, my guest today, the venerable Carl, Mr. Black Label Logic, cracking open a beer um, to, to get the, the festivities going, as it were. Welcome to the show. We are live. I'm live with uh, Carl, Black Label Logic. Hello, Carl. Hey, Troy. Great to be on. I don't think we've ever done a two-man show before, have we? I don't think we have, no. I mean, I was very keen. Obviously, you've been somewhat out of the picture over the last six months or so. Um, and when you started to sort of emerge again, I was very keen to to get you on. And I think it's cool to do this now. We're still in, we're in the sort of hinterland, aren't we? Because of the way Christmas has fallen, there's this like two day thing after New Year and everyone just wants to, I mean, people are at work and really they just want to go home because it's basically the weekend and probably not doing anything. So it's this weird sort of period that's not the same as that period between Christmas and New Year, but it's sort of akin to it in the sense that, yes, the New Year started, but it doesn't quite feel like it's really started until we get to next next Monday. So in that sense, it's still a good time, I think, for a sort of reflection and looking ahead and thinking about the way things are, perhaps where we come from, where we're likely to be to be going. So it's really great to have you on. Yeah, thank you. I know it's kind of a weird period. I took these two days off, so I'm still kind of dialing up my sleep, trying to get my bedtimes back in order and cutting back on the drinking. Mm. Did you have a pretty debauched um, period over Christmas then, or how, how did it go for you? Well, yes and no. I always like to have, like, Christmas Eve is always kind of a traditional thing. Usually I like to be with family or something like that. Yeah. It's just mm. always been a tradition. Yeah. And then it starts to get progressively worse going through the week because it's always fun to do a lot of partying over between Christmas and New Year's because people are like, what happens during that holiday period stays during that holiday period. Yeah, totally. Totally, man. I, f I feel you. I mean, um, for me, it's been relatively quiet this year. I have to say, I've been sort of hanging out with my girl. We've been sort of like doing sort of pretty lame kind of Christmassy type things. Not lame, apologies if she's watching. I mean, we went ice skating, crap like that, but there, there wasn't any real like wild partying. So the reason by the way, I'm wearing this ridiculous jacket is because I'm gonna be starting a new live stream show uh, this year called Gold Standard, uh, which is basically gonna be a red pill show, but just, just taken from my own sort of perspective. And I wanted to bring a little bit of the sort of degeneracy to it. I wanted to bring a little bit of sort of Weimar Berlin to it. So hence I'm wearing this very showman-like uh, jacket but to be honest this is about as crazy as i've got over the whole period so perhaps we can take things a little bit uh a little bit further on today's uh broadcast yeah well i always like to get into those topics but i think it's interesting to see the dimensions of things because I, i'd like rather have life be a series of highs and lows than just a flat line yeah it's interesting you say that actually because i did a tweet yesterday um and this is just completely coincidental, so I'm not I'm not bigging it up or anything. But I, I said, um, if you could live on, if you could exist on just a flat line, and you could have no emotional highs and no emotional lows, that would probably be the easiest way to live as a human being in a way. Because um, the difficult, and I think I was thinking about Christmas actually when I said that, because the difficulty I've had with Christmas in recent years is it sort of it sort of takes you up onto a high, doesn't it? Everyone gets really excited. It's like, oh my god, it's Christmas, and then the day comes, and then it's a bit mediocre. It's sort of like, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit sort of, um, uh, you know, it's a bit of a non-event. And then the next day, and then you're into January, which is the most depressing month of the year. So in a sense, I was thinking if you, if you could iron out the highs, you wouldn't have to experience the lows. But of course, the problem is who would actually want to live like that? Who could live like that? Tradcons. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that, you know, I'm sure we're going to get into that in some detail. But I mean, the whole Tradcon thing that we're we're seeing at the moment on, on Twitter is, is basically that, isn't it? It's basically a decision to abdicate from the sort of the highs and lows of life, from the, pre the pleasures that exist potentially in life. And to just say, do you know what? I'm going to go for this very sort of mediocre, sanitized existence. Um, and that seems a great shame to me. Well, I think it's just... I stole a concept of a psychologist at one point between static and dynamic. And I think some people kind of crave that static existence where they reach a point which they think is their peak and they just want to try and maintain that forever. 
And yeah. I usually do the analogy with the European borders post-1945. Mm. Because if you look at how the borders have been fluctuating since about for at least a thousand years, they've always been changing. They've always been dynamic. And that's why you get some of the more interesting areas in Europe. Like you get the areas that, okay, they were occupied by the French, then the Germans. So you get this weird blend of the two cultures. Mm. And you have these migrations that I think make for really interesting cultural experiences, cuisine, et cetera. Yeah. And since 1945, everyone was like, no, we have to stop doing that. So we're just going to put everything down and we're just going to maintain these borders forever. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing with a lot of guys that kind of, they get to a point and they get one or, one or two of those early highs. And then they just want to maintain that for the rest of your life. And that's really yeah. how you get a conservative because they have this idea of a period in their mind. And they're just like, we'll just keep it like this forever. This suits me. Mm. Mm. Yes. And it seems to me that you can never, I mean, Brendan's just said here, people cry predictability until it, until it bores them, which is the, the sting in the tail, isn't it? Um, but it, it just seems to me, when I was a kid, actually, I always imagined, I imagined that I would some, at some point reach a plateau in life when everything would be, stable and it wasn't necessarily that i imagine being married or anything like that but I, I just sort of thought there will be a time in my life perhaps in my 40s when i will have got to this plateau and and everything will be stable and everything will be sorted and, and that'll be it you know and i'll have i'll have sort of got over the hump of having to do all the difficult stuff in life and i'll have made it or or i'll, I'll be at a certainly at a, a place where i can sort of rest and reflect and i've never found that to be the case in my own life but also in the lives of people that i observe around me you know it's sort of like um i think it's an illusion to think that you can reach that that space now obviously perhaps some of people do perhaps some of the more successful kind of trad type dudes do reach a sort of family situation where they can, but I don't think so. I think there's all these dynamics that come into play. I think there's always good conflict and, and particularly between genders as well. Well, I just think it comes down to like women are like, if you're completely predictable to a woman, you're boring. Yeah. But at the same time, even with sex, you find that if you have someone as a plate or a girl long enough, even sex starts to get kind of predictable that you do the same things roughly in the same order with a few variations on them. Mm. And I think throwing a monkey wrench into that every once in a while kind of helps keep things exciting. Yeah. I mean, the problem of monotony or boredom or ennui or whatever we want to call it, I mean, is there any getting over that? Because it seems to me there isn't for human beings. It seems to me the problem with uh, monogamy and particularly long term monogamy, marriage, and all these kinds of things, is that, um, unfortunately, people just get bored, don't they? Um, and it's not just women, it's men as well. But um, the, and, and the difficulty I have with some of these trad types is they sort of say, well, we can rise above our bestial natures. Do you know what I mean? We don't have to be the animals that it's not just about sex. We, we're, we're beyond that. And I always think, well, yes, we are, or we can be. But you've got to be absolutely certain that the person that you're with is on board with that as well. And they might not be, or they might not be in 10 years time when you put on weight and you've lost your job. Oh, at the same time though, you have to keep in mind that, you know, a lot of people, they are, they are the human equivalents of mayonnaise. Mm. Completely boring, very little imagination, very low need for excitement, very high need for consistency. So they just want things to be predictable, relaxing, and comfortable. And mm. if I get too comfortable, I just kind of get annoyed with myself because I need to do something new. And it yeah. doesn't have to be necessarily anything big, but just take up a new hobby, try and get a new PR at the gym, uh, just something new to keep that excitement going. Yeah. And a lot of people yeah. fall into that with shopping and that they'll – buy something new to kind of break the monotony then they're happy for two days then they get bored again yeah and i think that's just uh, it's that fight club scene where he uh, blows up his own apartment sorry yeah. spoiler alert for a film that came out 20 fucking years ago but <laughs> yeah. it's essentially trying to just reach some ideal life that somehow you got in your head that would be your ideal and it never turns out that way because once you get there you get bored or you realize it's not all it's cracked up to be 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I just don't see myself how we get around this issue of, of boredom. And I think, uh, do you, do you, you're, you're familiar with Black Dragon, aren't you? You're aware of his, his stuff. Yeah. I mean, he, I think he writes about it quite well. I, I kind of like, I think he's a bit under referenced in this part of the, the you know, he, he's sort of a bit separate perhaps from other people in the manosphere, but it's sort of like, um, I think he encapsulates it quite well when he just says, you know, it's going to set in, that the ennui, the boredom is going to set in. Uh, and even if it doesn't for you, it's going to for her. And it's after, I think he talks about the sort of the three-year golden honeymoon period. And then after that, this starts to set in. Now, that doesn't, I'm not saying that therefore long-term relationships can never work and you shouldn't get married and you shouldn't, you know, and all of that. Because obviously, clearly, it, it, it can work out. People make it work. Nevertheless, it does seem to me to be a structural problem within the LTR that, that this is just human nature, isn't it? That we just want novelty. Yeah, and I think that's the kind of the interesting thing, though, with the with how an LTR used to be versus what it is now. Yeah. Because it used to be much more akin to a business partnership. Yeah. Where you had two people who got together, not necessarily because they were, quote unquote, in love or because they had this mad desire for one another, but mostly because uh, they decided to do something together. So the woman needed the man because she didn't want to be like the uh, the spinster and the man yeah. needed the woman because he wanted kids and he needed a housekeeper and so on. So those two worked very well together. Yeah. However, the yeah. problem comes now when rather than being a practical solution to a set of practical problems, marriage is supposed to be the path to self-actualization. And that's yeah. where I think the trap in that it's, it's double-sided. One, they're viewing their wife and family as their path to self-actualization, the top of Maslow's pyramid, rather than the solution to the bottom three steps. Mm. And secondly, they're also treating it, they're trying to be the cool dad. It, you can mm. push that under the rug. They're trying to say, look at how cool my life is, even though I have a wife and kids. It's like the um, there's a scene in How I Met Your Mother where mm. the two single guys are making fun of the guy who's only been with one girl and has been in a steady relationship for like 10 years about yeah. his not count. And he comes back with this tally. Well, we've had sex at least twice <laughs> a week for the past five, 10 years. So that means I've had sex so and so many times and therefore my notch count is technically higher than yours yes it's uh, that type of mindset so uh, yeah it's funny and sorry carry on no nah, i was just making a sigh at the type of thinking <laughs> go ahead try it, it's funny how um the trad dudes will come back with that as well though if you're if you get into a, a, an argument on twitter about this kind of thing you know you'll get the guy who's been married for 27 years and he says yeah but i'm still having sex with my wife three times a day you know she's 53 i'm you know i'm 56 we've been married for 27 years and it's still amazing and um i mean do you really do you buy that maybe in the odd situation but not really I mean, mm. I've seen statistics on it, and sex tends to normalize, and the high end is sort of two, three times a week, and yeah. the low end is sort of like two, three times a year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a reason there are, people have been making jokes about how rare sex is in marriage for the past probably three, four, five hundred years. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and of course... I suppose all of this is exacerbated by the theme of the, the show today really is, you know, 2020 vision, looking ahead to 2020 and I guess beyond because we're entering a new, a new decade or we've entered a new decade. Um, and of course, technology is the obvious thing. It's been talked about loads. We're all aware of, of the technological advancements that have taken place, but in the last you know decade or so, but obviously you've got Tinder, you've got Instagram, uh, you've got all of the, you know, this global connectivity that we have, this ability to, uh, to travel around the world very cheaply as well, which is another thing. So now we're starting to see what Rollo always talks about as being this global sexual marketplace. Um, and when we did Rule Zero the other day, my, I was saying, and this is this is just my view, is that I, I just can't see that slowing down. I can't see that genie going back into the portal. I just think things are only going to get worse from here. But what it, what it means is that, let's say for women, I mean also for guys, but let's say for women, 
there is almost infinite choice now, isn't there? You know, if you're a girl in a Siberian village and you are by by UK standards a nine, um, whereas before your potential pool of suitors was going to be your the people in the village, now it could be some dude you know with a yacht in Dubai who flies you over for the weekend. So what does that? What does this mean for us? Are we are we going to see a seismic change now in in how we mate as a species? Do you think? I don't necessarily think that. I think that's kind of a law of large numbers thing. Yeah. And it's one of my been one of my pet peeves with how the manosphere talks about certain things, such as women's notch counts and the level of thottery. Mm. And one thing that came out through the uh, one thing you can say positive about the British is that. Mm. You guys have hella statistics on your entire population. Mm, mm, yeah, a and lot of those stats were really s- Yeah, I have I have two sets. I have an American set and I have a British stat. Mm. And British girls are some of the most hoish I've ever seen ever. They Excellent. make the South Florida girls look like church girls. Rule Britannia. There we go, Union yeah. Jack. But mm. what you see is you have kind of a bell curve of notch counts among women where like you have like the ones who have barely any experience so they're like zero to three partners and i'm reciting this from memory so i may not be entirely accurate and then you have the more normal girls who are maybe between four and seven partners Mm. and then you have the extreme thoughts that are like seven to infinity yeah yeah, they had some because they stopped counting when mm. you went. I think it went up to fifteen plus was the last category. Mm. Okay, and I think okay. this is going to be more reflective of reality simply because everyone sees the thoughts very well because that's what you see on Instagram. It's what you see on Twitch. Mm. It's what you see on Tinder, and then you have like this underside of things where you have girls who are in. They're sort of serial monogamists. If they say they yeah. have three partners, they probably have seven. Mm. But it becomes kind of disingenuous to pretend that all girls out there have a notch count of 457 by the time they're 17. Well, it, yeah, that's something I've always been a bit suspicious about because it, it certainly doesn't seem to tally with my own personal observations and the people that I've come into contact with. And obviously, you know, I've dated a lot and I've been in, you know, lived in London a long time and I've been in this scene and everything so i've met quite a lot of quite a lot of girls and i've been guys and things like that and it, it it doesn't seem to me that that's always the case but then i sometimes think am i just being incredibly naive and actually you know these girls do have these incredibly high notch counts and i'm just not seeing it but i'm really i'm not sure i'm really not sure i think in a lot of cases well some obviously do there are some girls yeah. who have rack up massive notch counts but and i think that yeah sorry yeah, because it's just very easy for a hot girl or even a mediocre-looking girl to rack up a very high notch count over a short period of time. Because, I mean, you have yeah. girls who have 20, 30 partners by the time they're 18. Yeah. But then you also have, like, a lot of girls who lose their virginity when they're, like, 18, 19, and 20. Mm. So I think it becomes a law of large numbers thing. And for those who are not familiar with that, it just says that when you have a huge pool of samples the numbers tend to trend towards the mean. Okay. So if you do the entire globe, for instance, okay, maybe British girls and American girls, Aussie girls, and, you know, New Zealand girls are just complete hoes. Hmm. Maybe those girls have notch counts in the 30s, 40s on average, but then you have to include, you know, the girls from Qatar, from the United Arab Emirates, who have never been allowed outside the house who yeah. might have a sneak notch count of like two. Yeah. And if yeah. you start doing a country, like let's just say you take the States, you have the hosts in Miami, in New York, in LA, in those major yeah. urban centers where it's not so easy to keep track of who's fucking who. But mm-hmm. you also have all the small town girls who've never been outside their small town and who m- might have a notch count of, you know, three to five and where they're more prone to, longer term relationships purely based on population demographics. Yeah. So what you're saying then is that you don't think that there is this sort of 
high notch count kind of apocalypse that's going on out there that, that sort of warrants all of the negative attention that we sometimes see from some of these guys in the manosphere. Well, I do get why some guys are nervous about the high notch counts, but those are, I still think those are a relative minority yeah. in the overall sexual marketplace. Yeah, I, I, exactly. I mean, as I say, that would seem to me to, to chime with my own observations of my own personal experience. I mean, sometimes I see these things and it sort of says, oh, you know, if she's a hot girl and she's in New York, you know, she's had she's a had hundred partners before she's like 23 or something. And I, 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 I take it with a pinch of salt, to be honest. I, th I think perhaps some do, but I think many, many don't, you know, and I think that's, you know, I don't, I don't think things have, have changed that much. I think there is still a certain um social stigma and a certain sort of internal conflict that girls will have about about sleeping with large numbers of dudes i just think it, you know i think for many girls that is just still there i don't think we're in this complete jungle that people try to portray it as being like some areas sure i mean you see that in some of the ghettos in the united states where you have a chick who has seven kids from 19 different dads yeah yeah. And, but these are the extreme cases. And that's kind of one of those things that annoy me with every side in this debate is that all the focus is on the edge cases. Yeah. And the edge yeah. cases are a good warning. You really do want to know that there are women out there who's had 400 partners who press fake accusations, who stab men, etc. You want them to be aware of the dangerous women. Yeah, but you also want them to be aware that the majority of women are not that kind of woman. So mm. when you say a Walt, I think it's necessity to say that okay, you have a Walt, and then you have degrees of a Walt. Yes. Mm. So you yes. have like the BPD. That's kind of the extreme case. Everything dialed to eleven. And on the other hand, you have the girl who's probably more of a small town girl who's insulated in a fairly conservative community, either from religions or ethical or whatever factors are there. Uh, so you have both of those. And then you have a big median where, yeah. you know, okay, she's not an absolute hoe, but she has had racked up, you know, five to seven to 10 partners. Yeah. 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 So what, what does all this mean then? Do you think for guys, out there who are watching this i mean so i suppose you've got two groups of guys broadly speaking haven't you we've got the sort of the traditionalist more conservative dudes who who think about all this stuff with horror and think oh my god you know there's these girls out there fornicating and engaging in degenerate debauchery and all of that kind of thing and then there's probably other guys who are watching this who are sort of rubbing their hands going oh this is awesome you know that there, there are girls out there who are really loose and that means that i can get you know more of the action if you like so I mean, how would, what would you say to, to both of those groups? Well, again, I think it comes back to the bell curve. You're always going, and you always, I think, had the kind of guys who rack up a massive notch count. And yeah. all through history, whether that's uh, Casanova back in the day, it's Don Juan, you have yeah. various emperors and baronets and libertines, et cetera, through mm -hmm. our history. And then you have kind of the very traditional guy who's a virgin at marriage, et cetera, or he has one partner, he marries his high school sweetheart. Something I think was a trend back when you had smaller towns and you lived all your life in one town. Because yeah. it's very hard to be a hoe and land a good husband in a small yeah. town. Yeah. Because everyone yeah. knows. So that's kind of the having to balance, you know, what Rolla refers to as women's dualistic sexual strategy, where mm. they want that short term alpha excitement but they also want that security in the end and yes. that's very hard and you know even if you go into those conservative small towns today they will tell women you know hey watch it you're not going to be able to land a husband if you do this shit or if you don't know how to cook you won't be able to land a husband yeah absolutely and that sort of links in with what we were talking about before we came on air about sort of the urban centers because and, and actually um you know i've lived in london for a long time but i've also spent a lot of time in new york and other big cities around the world and um it's kind of interesting because in the sort of pua community in the player community you would get guys um 
basically saying you need to move to the cities because the cities are where it's at because not only is there a bigger population of girls but also the anonymity cloaks it so it makes it easier for girls to act out on their you know um on, on their sort of hindbrain desires, if you like. Um, and perhaps that's got something to do with the reason why, with, with why the trads are becoming increasingly anti-urban. If, if you look at a lot of the trad rhetoric that's coming out of these guys, it's, a lot of it is, is, is getting towards this low, move, move out of the cities, they're sinful, move to the country, get a yurt somewhere in you know, Montana, um, wife up a good woman and have 15 kids. Uh, it's becoming this very, rural sort of pastoral sort of idyllic vision now isn't it from the trads um yes yeah, pole pot with the christ say again pole pot with christ uh, if you don't yeah. if you're not familiar the red the Khmer Rouge, one of their main oh, yeah, things yeah, was anti-urbanization and go back towards an agrarian lifestyle and a lot of what i'm reading from the trads is the same thing it's you know go to get a small homestead have a yard, grow your own vegetables, live outside the city. And I kind of get that because cities are where it's possible both to, to be a player and to be a hoe. Mm. I mean, it's very hard to be a player in a small town too because every girl will know who you are and you will yeah. have that reputation. Yeah, exactly. Which is why people like Paul Janker, you know, the, the famous New York day gamer would say to guys, if you're really serious about this stuff, move to New York. You know, it's, it's all very well to call me up from, you know, some small town near Ohio and sort of say, how do I get good at day game? But the reality is you need the traffic and you need the anonymity. So get to the cities, but it's, I'm finding it fascinating because I've always been a city kind of a guy. Do you know what I mean? I was actually brought up in the, my parents were born in London. My family's all from London, but I was actually brought up in the countryside and even as a kid, I couldn't wait to get away from it. I wanted to get to the bright lights. I wanted to get to the city. I wanted all of that sort of, you know, the, the excitement and the, the relative anonymity and all of that kind of thing. And it's kind of really fascinating to me how you've got these dudes who are really pushing against that. And in a way, it's not that I totally don't understand it because I think a lot of, a lot of city life is, let's say, shallow and superficial. Do you know what I mean? And I think there is something to be said for just going and living on a hill somewhere and kind of doing, you know, writing your your, your memoirs or your great novel or something. But I don't know. I, I'm, I'm certainly not there yet. And I, I just feel these dudes, that, that there's, there's just this big moral moral crusade now against cities and against modernity, really, I think, that's coming through. Well, I think a lot of guys would really like to go back to, let's say, the pre I'm tempted to say 1950s, but I'm more tempted to say the pre-war period. Right. They want to go back to when you had small communities where, you know, you had the lumber mill and, you know, everyone lived there and worked the lumber mill and you had your kind of traditional, uh, yeah, don't mince words, Troy, the trads are wanting a very white Christmas. Hmm. Well, yeah, but uh, is the fire department ready to uh, douse all those crosses? Yeah. <laughs> No, but I think the whole thing comes, and I think the interesting thing is to see how those trends are kind of coming together. Because in the urban cities, you have this anti-multinational trend, you have the pro-artisanal crap, you have the farmer's markets and all yeah. this kind of small-scale stuff that's becoming a trend now to avoid like the big multinationals. Mm. And at the same time, you have the trads where like, don't go to the city, but make sure to get your Viagra from Pfizer and, you know, support Coca-Cola and PepsiCo and all these things. Yeah. I mean, one thing that interested me, and perhaps you can, you can shed some more light on this, is that um, as far as I understand it, I think anti-globalization used to be quite a leftist sort of cause, you know, back in the 90s. It used to be the left that were really worried about globalization because it was this encroachment of, of capitalism, this encroachment of big capital. And now... You've got all these dudes on the right who are vehemently anti-globalization and they call it, you know, Satan and the globo homo, you know, whatever or whatever they call it, you know. Um, and that's always seemed to me an interesting contradiction in a way, because I always associate the right with 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 commerce, with business, with making money, you know, and screwing people over. And uh, but now it's reached now it's reached this pitch suddenly the right don't like it anymore. They're like, no, no, get rid of big business. We hate it. They're, they're bad, you know, and it, it just seems an odd sort of dichotomy to me. Yeah, I think it's, 
how do I put this? I think like the Corbinites, they're probably pro globalization because their view is a communist global utopia. Right. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that lot can fuck off. I've never met anyone who lived under actual communism who is pro communism. On the other yeah. hand, one of the core things with communism is state owned enterprise and monopolies. And what we're getting with a lot of the big multinationals, we're getting pseudo monopolies or oligopolies. Because, you know, uh, Nestle has 147 different brands. So it looks like you actually have choice, but there's like one big spider pulling all the, th the threads there. Same thing with the Johnson & Johnson, uh, Pfizer and Bayer. So you have these massive corporations who are just dominating their sectors. And even in tech, like Google, Cisco. Mm -hmm. And I think that's maybe why you're getting so much uh, backlash with Huawei, because you actually, you're getting competition and if there's one thing a capitalist hates deep down, it's competition. Yeah. Yeah. That was a bit of a tangent there, but I think part of the rights anti-global perspective is based on national sovereignty and nationalism. And I think some of that is positive because I, I didn't want to get into Brexit with you, but I think one of the reasons why Brexit happened is that the EU and the free flow of capital, people, etc. It's a good thing for like the middle class and up who like to travel, they have an education so they can work in another country, they uh, may enjoy traveling abroad, etc. But it's a big negative for the guy who's sitting in Manchester and is a tradesman and who's mm. suddenly being underbid by foreign companies who may be getting, they're not under the same regulations, they don't have to pay the same taxes, they have a lot of benefits because a lot of our national economies are built around a set only that only counts for the country itself. It doesn't count if you're a Polish uh, carpentry company wanting to come to the UK, then you can skip half the rules. Mm. Whereas the mm. carpenter in the UK, he has to follow all those rules. So he's at a competitive disadvantage. Yeah. And part of Adam Smith's original theory was uh, the, uh, what was it? Or is it Ricardo? Maybe I can't remember quite, but the a competitive advantage in a certain area. So if you have cheap labor, you can produce things cheap that are labor intensive. Mm. If you have a lot of uh, oil and gas resources, you can probably subsidize energy intensive industries. So that becomes a competitive advantage based on what the uh, world wants. But what you're seeing is unfair competition. And that's what Trump is going against with China. And that's what Boris is bitching on about when it comes to a lot of the foreign companies on UK soil. Yeah, so I mean, globally, we are seeing, I mean, obviously, Brexit is one example of it but we are seeing this shift towards towards nationalism aren't we and and throughout other eu countries as well i mean italy's got a very nationalist government now has a very strong nationalism in italy um obviously uh hungary and poland uh, and and sort of and, and and what's happening in the states as well so there there really is a a push against this against this sort of globalization which seemed to be it seemed to just be the dominant way for so long, didn't it? It just seemed to be, this is the way things are. We're just going to end up as effectively one big country. And now it kind of feels like um, that main, you know, I don't know. How do you see things going? Do you see further fragment fragmentation as we go forward? Well, I think what you've seen in the US, that really works very well as a federal type organization. Because every state in the U.S. is technically its own country. Yes. And then they're united in a, in a, on a federal level. And that's kind of what they try to do with the EU. The difference is that once they when they established the U.S., those were nascent countries without much of a history and without much of a national identity. I mean, the Texans are still going hard on that, but they're pretty much the only ones. Mm. While in Europe, you have a lot of history there that makes it very difficult. And I'm in favor of the EU on some levels, like standardizing education. So if you have a master's degree from, let's say, the UK, you can go and work in Italy and have it recognized. Yeah. 
especially within, you know, professions where you need a license to work like psychiatry and health. Mm. At the same time, I don't think you can have one joint. I don't think you can have open borders between the countries without the joint immigration policy and border control. I don't think you can have one currency without a shared financial policy. Yeah. And I'm yeah. also generally against unelected bureaucrats. So uh, it's like yeah. the tweet I sent out yesterday. Leave it up to the government to lose money selling drugs. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this uh, will be free. So Troy, are going to be in Berlin again? Yes. Um, yes, very soon. I mean, I go over there quite a lot. I think regardless of Brexit, I'll be I'll be over there. I, you know, I mean, we're still going to we might get our freedom of movement strip, but I'll still be able to go over there for 90 days out of 180 or whatever. So I'll, I'll be over there back and forth. I mean, I was looking at one point at relocating to Berlin permanently and um just this is just on a personal note so not really of interest uh, beyond that but um i i, I just uh, this is an interesting thing actually because we talk about nationalism and um brexit for me on a personal level has brought up lots and lots of different feelings um because on the one hand i was quite anti not even so much anti brexit but just anti hard Brexit in a sense. Like it always seemed to me to, to make sense to, to, to maintain the economic ties with with the EU just because they're our biggest, closest trading partner. I don't mind about leaving the legal entity particularly. I'm not really bothered what it says on the passport, but it, you know, the, the economic thing always bothered me. Um, and I was sort of pretty fairly anti-Brexit in a sense for, for a while. But um, the reality is, having tried to live outside the UK, I am very, very tied to to this country. You know, I am very tied to being in London. I'm very tied to, be, to, to being here. So as much as I would sort of, I might sort of rail against nationalism for, for effect, I'm not saying I'm a, I'm a, a you know, a, a loud and proud nationalist, but I think those feelings are, are natural. I, can, I, can, I sort of understand why people have them perhaps more now as a result of Brexit. I don't know. I'm... I'm not really educated on it. Like I said, I kind of, I wish the UK had remained in the EU just because I enjoy Nigel's rants in the EU parliament. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, apparently he's got a job as a warm-up man for Trump now. I don't know if that's true or not, but they, was, they were saying on TV the other day, he's because he, you know he went to some Trump rallies, didn't he? Um, uh, uh, before the last election. I think he did some warm-up speeches for Trump because it was just after Brexit. And apparently he's going to go back and, and do some more of that. So the uh, the US guys might be uh, lucking out. Yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm generally, I'm for globalism in the sense that we should let each nation maximize its competitive advantage. And that's a benefit to us all. Mm. And like, if you want to grow tea, it's probably better to do that in India than mm. to try and do it in uh, Yorkshire. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, so, okay, that's, yeah, sorry. No, so that's just maximizing resources. But what I'm more skeptical of is unfair competition because that's never been effective in capitalism. Mm. Like if China's artificially keeping their currencies low, if their factories do not have to follow the same emission standards or employee safety standards as factories in the US or in Europe, that's not a good thing. Or, you know, if Apple can get the cobalt, I think it is, for their phones from child labor in the Congo, that's not a good thing either. So I think what you kind of need is to get some international standardization on how do you it's kind of ironic to add frictions to open up for free competition, but I think that's what's necessary because right now the competitive difference is not created by the employees, the efficiency of production or anything related to capital. It's being created 100% by government regulation. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So Will's saying here, what do you think about the women in Berlin? Have you been, you've been to Berlin, Carl, haven't you? Yeah. What do, you, what do you think about the women in Berlin? <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the Berlin scene quite a lot, actually. It's a yeah. very upbeat vibe. And, you know, it's the same, kind of the same thing as London or any metropolitan uh, European city. Mm. There are a lot of German women there, but there are women from all over the world there. So you get like a, it's like a Baskin Robbins for different nationalities. It's very easy to rack up flags there. And the culture is also very, it reminds me a lot of, you know, uh, 
in Brooklyn and those kind of Williamsburg type of areas in a yeah. sense, but with in sense for punctuality and lists. Yeah, yeah. The good thing about Berlin is that um, it is very hipster um, and it, it is sort of um, like you say, it's sort of like Brooklyn. It's like that or Shoreditch in London. It's that very hipstery kind of feel. And, and I, I imagine a lot of guys um, watching this might might not like that because you know it's sort of like it's a bit it's a bit i don't know it's a bit it's a bit liberal it's a bit sort of you know and all, all of that um but the good thing about berlin is it's also got this incredibly degenerate debauch side to it as well um so it's not just a load of vegan it's kind of like japan. say again yeah 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 exactly, it's kind of exactly. Like japan japan is the same thing if you look at the surface it looks really rigid and stiff and traditional and then you have guys in fursuits yelling at their boss while they're drunk off their ass in a bar after work. Oh, man. I mean, it's just like fucking like every time I go to Berlin and obviously I go there quite often, I, I'll, I'll see something else that just blows my mind with how crazy and degenerate it is. I mean, these dudes on Twitter who think it's degenerate, you know, going on a I don't know, going on a date before marriage or something. I mean, they just have seen nothing. I've seen some just mind blowing stuff and it's all been in Berlin. It's just it's still crazy even now even with the gentrification that's going on there and everything. Um, I mean, man, it's just like, it's off the hook, you know? So, and that's why I really like it because it, it feels, actually, and funnily enough, right, I, have you read um, Bronze Age Pervert yet? Have you read uh, Bronze Age Mindset by, by that guy? No, I haven't. Well, I read it and I really liked it. Um, and it's sort of like, I don't even know how you describe it really. It's sort of a fictionish. it's a sort of a, it's a very literary sort of piece of writing and it's very sort of like, and he's obviously coming from a very right wing sort of nationalist sort of um, sort of angle. But one thing that really impressed me about it was that he really likes red light districts. He sounds like a bit of a, a degenerate um, fucker on the uh, on the side. And he talks about how he, he basically talks about uh, owned spaces. He says everywhere is owned by the corporations now. You know, you can't get to anywhere that's like sort of authentic and real, except sort of red light districts. And he says, so I always go to the red light districts whenever I go to a new city. And that bit really struck me because I've always sort of felt that, you know, and, and Berlin's still got that slightly red lighty sort of feel about it. I mean, how authentic it really is now, I don't know, but it's still present there. Well, it's still a space which is not totally image controlled. Because I think that's yeah. kind of what, and I've been talking about the image culture for years, and it's, it's sort of coming to a culmination now where authenticity is a rare commodity yeah because everyone is cultivating their social media feels uh not feels social media accounts they're controlling you know their how they're perceived in real life all the time so people are actually looking for a place where they can actually be themselves free of judgment because there's so much judgment being thrown around in the public space yeah yeah exactly and Another effect of um, bring it sort of trying to bring it back around to, to, to dating and sex and stuff a little bit. Um, one of the things that occurred to me about globalization is that it, I think it also affects the sexual marketplace. It, it affects guys, though, in the sexual marketplace, because don't you feel like I've always I've always preached this gospel of, you know, you've got to stand out. You've got to have radical differentiation. You've got to you've got to sort of be your own character if you want to make an impression in the sexual marketplace because too many guys and too many people in general are just very bland, vanilla, kind of the same as everyone else. And you want to break out of that. You want to be something different. You want to create an element of surprise. And it struck me while I was, I was, I forget which book it was. I think it was, um, it may have been um, How to Be an Arsehole actually, but it struck me that actually perhaps this is an effect of globalization because Obviously, we're all shopping in the same stores. We're all shopping in Zara and H&M and the same places. We're all sort of listening to the same music. We're all watching the same TV shows. So it become, we all become sort of homogenized, don't we? And I think as guys, that is um, not advantageous in the, out there in the dating world. No, it's not. And I've, I've been thinking about contrasts for a long time there. And because everyone is very similar, we're becoming more and more homogenized in the sense. So let's say you have the typical hipster look, mm. but you have kind of libertarian right values. That's going to be a contrast because you expect a guy who looks like a hipster to be like this liberal save the environment guy. Yeah. Same thing if you're kind of the button up corporate guy, 
but you have piercings or tattoos, that's a contrast. Yeah. Uh, or, and all these small things, like I, I carry a fountain pen with me. Right. Just because it's kind of a memorable thing because who carries a fountain pen these days? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely. it's kind of like, it's, um, that's an old mystery trick, by the way, with uh, all the small gadgets you have that make unique rings and bracelets and necklaces and everything. Yeah. So you just have to look at how can you, uh, no, I'm not showing you my sleeve tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> I have my yeah. name in them. <laughs> that would be counterproductive. Mm, mm. But no, but I think it's just about trying to find something that sets you apart from other people, especially if you are in a space where it, that's very conform, being the kind of guy that it could be something as simple as you're the only guy who occasionally curses. Mm, mm. I I just think that and so let me put this to you because this is this is just what I've been this is kind of what I'm thinking at the moment and what I'm sort of feeling but I haven't really tested it as a as a hypothesis but it seems to me that as that say the sexual marketplace on, on as a whole is becoming sort of more difficult because girls have got more choice um, you know it's much easier for her just to swipe and find somebody else and kick you to the curb if things aren't working out. Um, and it's much easier for her to flake on you for a date because she might get somebody messaging on Tinder two minutes before who's better. So there's a lot of competition out there. And I think that competition, it feels like it's increased. And it seems to me that guys need to combat that. The only option that guys have is to find ways to stand out. Now, obviously, one way to stand out is to be, you know, Andrew Tate and to have a, you know, six Lambos and, and all the rest of it. So people think of the obvious like money, wealth, status and things like that. And yes, that's part of it. But it's also just how you come across as a person, your charisma, how you present yourself. You know, you need to be standing out from the the pack. Would you? Do you think there's something in that? Uh, yeah, I think there's a good point. Like you have to find something that separates you out. I tend to call. I have a couple of essays on it called "Finding Your Competitive Advantage" or something of the kind. Yeah. I'm not like Rolo, so I don't have a full <laughs> Rolodex of all the essays I've ever done, but. And it just comes down to kind of cultivating what's unique about your personality because everyone has something. Mm. It's either mm. you could be the guy who's really into music, so you could put people on to new artists they've never heard of, or you could be the guy who's really into food, who knows all the good restaurants or the guy with connections at the club, or just kind of the, the guy. You need to have something that makes you unique. Mm. Mm. And what that is, it kind of depends on you more than anything. I usually advocate finding one or two of your core interests, provided they are attractive. Being the world's best at soul caliber is never going to have mainstream appeal, even though you may get some gamer girls who want that. But it could be rock climbing. It could be that you're really into art. It could. I mean, Goldman is probably my best example of someone taking their natural interests and mm. leveraging them well in the sexual marketplace. Yes, and of course he's done it very directly. So for people that don't know, Goldman wrote a book a couple of years ago about what he called photography game, which is basically taking out a camera and photographing girls and using that as a means to introduce yourself to, to girls. And I mean, Goldman is a very, as we know, a very sort of artistic guy. He's like a writer. He, I think he's a, he's a does other forms of art as well. And he's into his sort of, psychedelics and all that kind of stuff so he um yeah so exactly so there's a dude who has who stands outside of the mainstream really but clearly in an effective way because he he meets girls and he you know by all accounts uh, you know he, he does well so that's a really good example of somebody who is not just your average cookie cutter dude but i mean like what i see i don't know about you but when i go out and even in berlin actually where you think it would be really freaky i mean you, you go out and you see a lot of people who are very a lot of guys and girls as well but it, it, it matters less for girls because you as a girl you've just got to be cute and then you've got an in but a lot of guys who are very cookie cutter a lot of guys who are just wearing sort of gap style clothing and sort of like it, they're, they're, they're just a bit bland and, and a bit mediocre and i just i just get the impression that they're just not making that they're not making that much of an impression when they go in they're not they're not sort of like they're not engaging the girl and creating chemistry they're just sort of like 
you know, they're, they're just kind of coasting on their looks and hoping that something's going to happen. And I think you need to, you need to bring out some of the magnetism, guys. I think that's that's I think how the way that I'm seeing it at the moment. Yeah, I think it it just comes to catering to your natural strengths as well. Mm. Uh, like I'm good with storytelling. I'm good with humor. And I I have pretty good Kino game. So those are three of the things that kind of gets it to work. Because if you can link a story into something, like I had one date a while back where the girl was going on about this guy uh, touching her thigh and it was kind of weird. And you kind of leverage that. Well, you know, now that you said that, I'm just going to have to touch your thigh. Yeah. And kind of leveraging on that and, you know, being shameless never hurt. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Nobody I really ever like... got laid less by being shameless. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. Um, I'm reading uh, or rereading actually uh, uh, Seduction by Robert Greene at the moment. Have you, have, you, have you delved into that before? Yeah, I read it and I think it gives you some really good archetypes. You can kind of try and mm. leverage for yourself what fits you best. I know Tanner mm. Guzzi or... I'm not sure how he pronounces his name. I think it's Guzzi. He mm. uses some of those similar archetypes in his um, thing on how to dress. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm re I have to say, I, I really enjoyed um, Seduction when I read it again. And it's something I'm, I've got the paperback version. I'm going through making notes and it's something I'll probably be, you know, sort of using, you, you know, kind of using as a, as a, as a jumping off place for, for sort of content this year. Cause I think he's, he, there, there's so much in it that's, that's really gold, but, um, but yeah, the archetypes are really good, but I was sort of thinking of the, of the rake character who is so impassioned and so bold that he just blows women away with his, his ardor. And, and it sort of goes that guys will often say, well, I don't want to show too much interest because, if I show too much interest up front, then I'm giving her all the power and I reduce my power. I'm subordinate to her and therefore she, she won't find me attractive. And there's some truth in that, but there's also a way of angling it so that like if you if you're on a date with a girl and you look at her with intense desire, like she's the only girl on the planet, then she's going to feel that and that's going to make her feel something. Um, so I suppose that's an example of, of using a sort of a how do you even describe it? You know, using your, your presence to, to influence um, a, a, a situation, a, a growing sexual kind of communion with a girl. And I don't always see guys doing that kind of thing when I'm out. I, I see a lot of very sort of casual guys, guys trying to play it cool, guys trying to hang back and sort of not, not commit, you know? Well, there are three sides to it, I think. There's one is the guy who just hangs back. Hmm. Because you're always going to have those guys, the guys who are sitting at the bar just sipping their drink or, you know, they're standing in the corner talking to a couple of mates and so on and no one's approaching. And then you have, once you get into that community, because you have to communicate desire, but you have to communicate desire, not want, so to speak. Yeah. You have to communicate, I want to give you the dick. You don't want to communicate i want to give you a two-bedroom house with a white picket fence <laughs> well unless unless you're on trad twitter in which case maybe that is what you want to communicate oh yeah but that's uh, perfect that way you'll, you'll get lined up with like a 40 year old chick with four kids who uh, just looking for her next meal ticket <laughs> but yes, I, I just think it comes down to what are you communicating to this girl when you're talking to her because there's no shame in Communicating sexual interest is important because she will cue off you. Mm, mm, yeah. So yeah, if you're I, playful, she'll be playful. I mean, yes. women have a way of adapting themselves to whatever vibes they're getting from you. So if yes. you're like, I've, I've never slept with a girl when work became a topic of conversation less than 10 minutes into the date. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, your job as a guy is to steer it away from those things to the great to the greatest extent you can isn't it you know when i go um if i go on a date with somebody i i'm doing my absolute utmost to try to move it away from those bland sort of topics of discussion to keep everything very jokey very sort of fan you know fa almost fantasy based certainly in the first in parts of the interaction um because i don't want it to be falling back on that you know that boring question and answer type format that we're all so used to 
Yeah, same thing. And also, don't be afraid of taking up a lot of space, both physically and, let's say, mentally. Like, yeah. If you're the most interesting guy in the room, act like you're the most interesting guy in the room. Don't hang back and give other people space. Mm. You can, you have to do that at corporate events or in family dinners or dinners with friends. You don't have to do that on a date. Don't let yeah. her lead. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah. mode one. I'm not sure what arc is. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what arc is either. Julius, if you can let us know what arc is. Um, but I, I, I put that up because I reread uh, Mode 1 again very recently, and I, I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. I'm a, I'm a big, big fan of that approach. I mean, well, in saying that, of course, when he says Mode 1, he's really bloody Mode 1, isn't he? He's like basically going up to them and saying, I, you know, whispering in their left ear um, all the things that he wants to do to her within about two minutes of, um, of meeting her. And I, I'm perhaps... If I'm honest, I'm perhaps not quite that direct, but the principle I absolutely love because I was talking to a, dude, uh, a client about this yesterday, actually. I've always, uh, in, in face-to-face -face meetings, I've always, um, oh, ARC, Alan Roger Curry. I've always um, veered towards direct. Um, I like to cut to the chase. I don't like to mess around. I think it's, pretty obvious when you're approaching a girl that you are interested you know even if you walk up and you're like oh my god we're starbucks she kind of knows really what you want so you might as well own it it's more masculine it's more dominant it's more you're positioning yourself as the dude who goes out and asks for what he wants and he's used to getting it and that is the that's what that's the archetype i would rather be even if it means that i get rejected more times than I, I perhaps otherwise would. So I'm all, I'm really on board with that mode one concept, definitely. Yeah, and I'm also a big fan of don't wait, not wasting your time, because if you try and play indirect game, you don't get that clear rejection as fast as possible. Because it's, yeah. it reminds me of some of the day game stories that some of the guys have, where they they've been vibing great with a girl for forty five minutes. And they're like, can I get your number? And she's like, no, I'm married. I just enjoyed the attention. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I just, it just perhaps it's my personality as well, but I just prefer to cut to the chase because I kind of think, you know, we live in a busy world. We're all bombarded with information. There are all these different, um, you know, things going on all of the time. And we just, you just need to cut to the chase. You just need to get on with it. You know, go up, say what you want make some jokes, tease her a little bit, have a bit of a laugh, get the contact details and then go. You know, you, you don't want to be messing around. And this, the whole thing about, oh, the, the set has got to last, I'm talking now sort of day game really, the set has got to last for 20 minutes or it's not solid and all this kind of thing. It's absolute nonsense. You can get a number and you can, you can get a number within about a minute. You can walk up to a girl and say, hey, I just saw you. I thought you looked really cute. And do you know what? I would love to take you for drinks, but I've got to go because my boss is over there. We've got to go to a meeting in five minutes. And if she likes the cuss of your jib, as we used to say in Britain, you just give her the phone. She'll put the number in. You could be texting her. She could be out on a date with you that night. It, it, ha it honestly happens. You know, it, it, it's not people think, oh, I've, I've got to build up this, uh, this big connection between us. It, 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 it's not like that. The connection is instantaneous. And if the connection is there, it can, it can work for you, you know? Yeah, and I think this is a good uh, segue because I had a note here that said communication now is basically based on two factors. It's volume, meaning how loud you are, mm. and how extreme you are. Mm. Okay. And you That's see that on Twitter and politics, but you see, even in our space, you see that it's basically degenerates on one end, mm. and then you have the uh, trad guys on the other. There's very little in the middle. Yeah, yeah. You have, there are very few guys who are like, okay, get your notch count into the five and sevens, and then once you meet a nice girl, just settle down with her. It's either you have to marry your high school sweetheart and vet a wife, or you have to just fuck anything that moves. Yeah. And I think that's <laughs> yeah. kind of the nature of discourse. And it's also how loud are you? How many followers do you have? How many retweets do you get? How many Instagram likes and shares do you get? And I think that's really harming the discussion. And I think that's going to further exacerbate the situation we have now in the sexual marketplace where you have 
some men who are extremely successful, and if you look at mating, you have a higher proportion of men who are nicely used and who have two sets of families. So they have their first family in their 20s. They get divorced at 37 to 45, and then they go younger and they go to... Um, and then they go to a younger woman and then they have a second family and you have more childless men also. Mm. And I think that's just a, kind of an unfortunate trend of extremes because if you really want trouble in your society, have a lot of men who never get laid. Mm. 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 Yes, absolutely. And this is, that's the trad argument though, really, isn't it? Because that, that's the sort of, that's what trads will say if you come at them in regards to monogamy, or, or if you present yourself as a degenerate playboy or whatever, they will say, well, you're ruining Western civilization because if everybody did that, then then society would collapse. And of course, really, they're right. Um, if everybody did it, if everybody behaved in that way, then then yes, society would collapse. But the only sort of, the only thing you can really say about that is that that's never going to happen, is it? Um, you know, it's, it's never going to be, it's always, there's always going to be that balance between the guys who opt for a traditional life and, and the very few who, who shoot for something different, right? Well, again, bell curve. You're always going to have some guys who are getting laid much more and who enjoy that lifestyle, and then you're going to have some extreme trads, and then most guys are going to be somewhere in the middle with you know an average notch count, and they're probably going to end up settling down maybe a bit later than the trads, but way before the... Uh, upper side of the bell curve yeah and so maybe the trads they're looking to wife a girl up and have, start having kids at 23 mm -hmm. versus the average guy who does it at let's say 28 to 32 and then you have the upper end of that spectrum it might be 40 to 50 and you're always going to have that distribution so i don't see that as a big deal the question is just how far in one direction do you drag the average mean and mm. the way I see it with education, especially now, if you say you do everything, quote unquote, right. Yeah. So at 18, you go to uni. 18, 19, you go to uni. Then you have three to five years in uni. So you let's say you graduate at, let's say, 24, just for the sake of argument. Then unless you found someone in uni and you're still dating them, you're going to have to spend at least... I would say a minimum of three, four years with someone before you, you know, you start thinking about having kids. <clears throat> mm. Of course, you have people who move in within the first three weeks of meeting each other and it's just done for. But so then you're at 27. And then let's say your average couple tries for a year, then you're at 28 at your firstborn. Uh, if you decide to go hard at it, you might have your second at 30 and your third at, let's say, 32, mm. if you want three kids. And just this need to sort this whole thing out, there's a lot more for us to sort now than there used to be. Like the average guy who was born, let's say, in the 1950s, he could get a factory job at 18, he could buy his house at 20, and have three kids by the time it was 25. And from the information I've gotten from uh, a few friends of mine who got married and had kids while in university, that's pretty hardcore. Yeah. And if you want to do something successful with your job, you can't immediately go to maternity or paternity leave immediately uh, after you finish your education, because then you're going to be three, four years behind all your peers when you start applying for a job. Because if the question is, who do you hire for that uh, lower level position? Is it the guy who's, let's, or the woman who's 28, 29, 30 with two kids at home? Or is it going to be the 25 year old with no family obligations who can work 24 7? Of course, it's going to be the younger guy. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that's right. I mean, the, the problem with the trad fantasy, it seems to me, or the, the trad vision, let's say, is that um, it just doesn't seem to me to be compatible with the way that the modern world operates. I don't know. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that, really? I mean, I, I know we all we all like to we all enjoy back, you know, dunking on 
on the trads and the patriarchs and things. I mean, I mean, for myself, I think, I suppose, I suppose here's, the, here's my main issue with it, right? My, my main issue, and you had a really, really great tweet um, the other day about this, where you basically said, look, your children are not your legacy, or, or rather, you, you know, you say your children are your legacy, great. Well, okay, what about Newton? What about Einstein? What about, you know, all these people who've done these amazing things with their lives. And you've got these other dudes on Twitter who are basically like saying, well, you know, my children are my legacy. They're presenting what is actually the default societal, um, you, you know, lifestyle choice for centuries as being some sort of a grandized achievement. And that just has always seemed to me to be, uh, you know, disingenuous at best and, and probably a hustle for money at, at worst, you know? Um, or, or, I, mean, I don't know, what's your feeling on it? Well, I think a lot of guys misunderstood that tweet. Yeah. Because my point wasn't that you shouldn't have kids. Mm. My point was that making ejaculating in a woman your highest ambition in life, that means mm. you, just, you fucking lack ambition. Have slightly yeah. higher ambitions for yourself. And it doesn't have to be much higher, but... You know, even if you're in a small town, you can be the guy who does the charity drives. You can try to influence your community in a better direction through seeking public office or a position of some kind of power. You can write something. You can create something. You can start a small business. There are a lot of things you can do that require a bit more of you than merely ejaculating. And I'm not by any means saying that raising children is not a part-time job, it does require a few things, but we have to keep in mind that parenting now versus parenting a hundred years ago is very different. Like parenting yeah. now is, oh, you have to do all these things. You have to encourage their ambitions. You have to build their self-confidence. You have to do all this crap. And like a hundred years ago, you know, feed them occasionally. Yeah. yeah. It's becoming this avenue for people to, who are unhappy with, what they've accomplished in life to attain some feeling of success. That, yes, that, that's the issue. And I think, um, who was it? Was it Ryan who did, who did a poll where he said, he asked people who the, um, the most memorable patriarchs were. And it, and, and it was all people who'd done other things with their lives other than happen to have kids, you know, I mean, I think I think Charles Dickens had like I don't know, like seven, ten kids or something like that. But people don't remember Charles Dickens for the fact that he had a load of kids. They remember him for the fact that he wrote all of those books. Um, and and that's the point, isn't it? I think when having kids is conflated with this is my life's achievement, I think that's when it becomes a a problem, a bit of a false god in a way. And what I love about it is the fact that you actually have. People preparing to be men were buying into the female trope. Oh, yeah, being a mother is the hardest job in the world. No, it's fucking not. Try working on an oil rig. <laughs> yes. I mean, if sitting on, well, I can understand. Well, no offense, but when my, my grandmother is almost 100 years now, right? Her mother, okay, at that point, you know, she had to cart water up from a river heat the water over a wood-fired stove that she had to get uh, wood for. She had to prepare all meals from scratch. She had to wash clothes manually. She had to do the dishes manually, etc. At that point, okay, fair enough. That is maybe a full-time job. Mm. But when you have a washing machine, you have a dryer, you have a dishwasher, you have a food delivery services, and you even have robot vacuums. What the hell kind of job is being a stay-at-home mom anymore? Yeah. I mean, your kids yeah. are going to be in school uh, at least, you know, six, seven hours a day. And then if you sleep that, what, six-hour workday? That's hardly a, the hardest job in the world. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, I just think... I've always felt that people should look beyond that. And so, I mean, you know, the, the classic thing that people always say in the manosphere, which came from David Dader, I think, which is, you know, men should have a mission. Um, I think 
we should have a mission and i think the mission should be beyond family that's not to say don't have a family that's not to say having a family isn't an amazing thing if you if, if done in the right way and all the rest of it but i don't think it should be the mission do you know what i mean because i i i, I just think you need something beyond that as well you know um we've got a couple of questions here this one's been up for on the screen for ages Cut, Troy and Carl, do you think cutting to the chase gives enough time to convey what's your value so he's talking about when we were talking about day game before and i was saying just go in there and ask for the number um i, I personally i think it i think it does and i think um <clears throat> i think a bit longer could be advantageous, but I think I think basically, you know, there are a number of things happening when you approach, you cold approach a woman. So you are there's how you look, there's how you, uh, there's there's the eye contact you give, there's the the how you walk, how far, how quickly or slowly you walk, there's how you speak, the timbre of your voice, there are the words that you use. There are all of these micro indicators going into that interaction, and so even within a very short interaction. Attraction can be sparked or not. Um, and if it is, then you're on. And you don't actually need, and, and I've experienced this in my life many times, you don't then need hours and hours of chatting in order to, to strengthen that. In fact, it's, it could be disadvantageous for you to have longer. If the attraction isn't initially there, would it be worthwhile to have a bit more time to convey value? Possibly. But, you know, we have to be pragmatic and you have to think, okay, do I want to rack up the numbers here in terms of approaches um, and get good at this stuff? Or do I want to worry about making each one the perfect seven minute approach? What do you think? Would you have any views on that? Well, my, my record lays about 40 minutes from me to bed. So I think it's, Very it good. requires a little bit to pull off because you need to have, well, first off, I don't believe in the fact that it's predestined. I think, Every girl has their preferences towards what kind of guy she'll get into bed with fast. Okay. And that's looks-wise, that's behavior-wise, and so on. Mm. It's always going to be better to be more dominant, more direct, and so on. But the whole thing with cutting to the chase, it does convey value if she has the impression that you're a high-value dude. If you give up weak vibes or you don't have the right look, I mean, I know some guy, he experimented with what he called, I have a cold, I'm hungover, and I just want to get home game. Yeah, yeah. And that came to be because he, he, he had a massive cold, he was hungover, and he was just going to a Walgreens or something to pick up some meds. Yeah. And he saw there was a cute girl there, and he's in his sweats, his hair is in a disarray, his cold sweating, and he just walks up to her and he's like, I have a cold, I'm hungover, and I'm just here to get some meds, but I thought you were cute, I'd like to meet you when I'm feeling better, give me your number, or I'm going home. Yeah. And she just gave him, and, and that worked, because he just conveyed that, you know, I this is not what I normally am, but right now I'm under the weather, so, but I'm you're still hot, so I'm still going to approach you, even though I look like shit. And yeah. that conveys confidence. Yeah. yeah. The sense of urgency. But if you look if you look like a low value dude, like if you look like the last four months have been you playing Minecraft in your sweats, eating Cheetos and masturbating to furry porn, then that's not gonna work. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I think that, and, and there's probably some truth in this because I, I was reading something the other day, um, not related to game, but it was basically saying when we first meet somebody, and this could be either as a cold direct approach or if you're meeting somebody for the first time that you, you, you met online, you met on Tinder or something. When you meet somebody, do first impressions, are first impressions accurate or not? And the, the results of this particular study were, were saying that actually first impressions are or can be very, very accurate. Um, and I think that's because we give off so many micro indicators when we meet somebody. And we are, as human beings, much more adept at identifying those than, than we think. So if I meet, and again, this is not just about sex or, or, or dating. If I meet somebody who could be a guy or a girl, you get that instant sort of impression about them. And certainly what this study would suggest is that more often than, than not, you might be right about that. And so I think that's what's happening with girls. You're walking up to the girl, 
you, you're probably you, you don't even need to say anything or you just say hi or something like that she's going to get an idea of you very very quickly and if that idea is on point if that's in line with what you know she's attracted to then then that attraction is going to be solidified really quickly but i think it's not it's not her being unfair i think it's actually probably and again this is why we always talk about self improvement and everything you need to do the work as rich cooper would say you need to you, you know you need to do the self improvement because what you communicate even in very brief periods of time is is probably going to be more accurate to what you actually are than you think so if you are the dude who's sitting in his basement eating cheetos for most of the time she's going to pick up on that and she's going to be right yeah and girls are incredibly good at picking up on these things they're much better than we are yeah it's, uh, yeah. I think it's Bill Burr who has a great bit on that. He, him and his girlfriend are going to a party at some girl's house and they didn't bring any wine. And the girl is like, oh, and the host is like, oh, you didn't bring any wine. Well, I guess that's okay. Uh, just come on in. And she walks away and his girlfriend was like, did you see what that bitch just did? He's like, what? She said it was okay. And, you know, once you're trained to observe these micro indicators that girls do, then you kind of understand the underplay that was going on there. But yeah. if you're not trained to do that, you're not going to pick up on it. Yeah. The same thing with how girls tend to semi move into your apartment. Mm. Mm. And because they know that, you know, if another girl comes over to your apartment and you have scented candles, you didn't buy those. Some girl did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If, mm. Or, you know, all kinds of weird stuff like that. They might put, you know, like some some flowery scented potpourri in the bathroom, and it's like, okay, the guy didn't buy that shit. That's a girl purchase. Yeah, yeah. And it's all kind of subtle, them staking their claim to your apartment as their zone. Yeah, yeah. And it's a slow infiltration, isn't it? It doesn't happen overnight, necessarily. Yeah, women never direct attack. They slowly, they're like a Trojan horse. They come in and it's just the sex and deep inside there's a whole slew of scented candles, throw pillows and rugs. Exactly, exactly. Um, got another point here from Return of the Mac. The Nihilist Challenge, not even ambitions bigger than having kids are going to outlast the inevitable death of the earth, the sun, etc. in the grand scheme of things. Well, I mean, he's right, isn't he, really? Um, but... I, I mean, I, I would agree with that. And if I if I post something like that on Twitter, I'll get flamed by all of these trads who will be like, oh, my God, you're so degenerate and everything. But, but you know, logically, he is correct in what he says. Um, but I personally, I don't know how you feel about this, Carl, but I personally don't let, let that bother me. I still think, okay, fine, well, I'm going to die. If, if I write 100 books, they're all going to be forgotten um, probably in my lifetime, but certainly, you know, <laughs> certainly after my death and everything else. And um, so what does it matter? So I could just lay in bed and do nothing. But I don't quite surrender to that. I still feel pleasure in in having a mission, um, you know, in creating content, in writing, in doing these things, even though, yes, ultimately, you could argue that it's all futile. I still feel a, I still feel a great sort of pull to do those things, right? I don't know how you feel about what he's saying here. Well, first off, people using words they don't understand really gets on my nerves. Okay. Because Nietzsche is kind of the poster boy of nihilism. Mm. And Nietzsche never said that life had no meaning. He said that life has no grand overarching meaning, therefore we must develop that for ourselves. Yeah. yeah. That was the whole point be behind his philosophy was... Okay, there is no God. God is dead. There is no grand scheme of things. But this is actually a good thing because it gives us the freedom to figure out for ourselves what we want to do that define and gives meaning to our lives. So I just hate when people use things like nihilist as a pejorative. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't know that he was doing that so much, but it's certainly something, no, that, gets, it's just, uh, something that gets on my nerves when people use yeah. the term. I don't think he was doing it. Yeah, we certainly see that all the time on bloody Twitter, don't we? I mean, it's not, you know, it's nihilist, degenerate and all this kind of thing. And um, yeah, it's 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 uh, a malapropism. Is that who oh, you know, the good thing is, you know, when people 
go down to the level of using pejoratives and insults, they've run out of arguments. And I think that's kind of the whole thing this trad shit is. It's just basically lifestyle marketing. Yeah. It's not lifestyle. I can respect people who lifestyle market based on I need to make some money to fund this lifestyle. Yeah. I can in a way accept that because I mean that's the hustle. And even since the days of Robin Leach, we've had the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Mm. So that's that's fair enough. They've been doing that shit for years. But what gets to me is like the trends aren't really lifestyle marketing to make a buck. They do, but that's coincidental. The main goal behind their lifestyle marketing is to evaluate, is to uh, not value it, but um, confirm their own lifestyle choices. Have you noticed that not a single one of the trad guys is a single guy looking to get into the trad lifestyle? It's guys who found themselves in the trad lifestyle and in the red pill space, usually because their girl cheated on them or left them or pulled some bullshit. And now they're trying to market that lifestyle so they can build a tribe around them who confirm that they made the right choice. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like a communist version of, did I do good, daddy? Did I do good? Yeah, yeah. Say you're proud of me, dad. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so what? Do you, how do you see this, this working out as we go forward then? Because... It seems to me that you, you, I mean, I suppose in the big scheme of things, what, what happens to the individuals we're talking about is of, is of less relevance. But I mean, you know, we've got all of these dudes who are sort of about 30, who are mouthing off on Twitter about how, you know, you should wipe them up and all the rest of it. Um, I suspect we're going to see some of those relationships or marriages, you know, fail. Um, not, not wishing that on anybody, but, you know, that is kind of the reality of things. And then these guys are going to have to come back and sort of change I suppose change their narrative or sort of shift their positioning a little bit. I mean, I mean, as far as the manosphere is concerned, I don't know really. What do you think about this whole incursion of trad into the manosphere? Do you think it's a passing thing, or do you, do you think the split is now, the schism is now so great, and and it will go along two tracks, or how do you see things sort of ending up as far as the space is concerned? I think it's probably. I I don't use the term manosphere anymore, by the way, because someone went ahead and ruined that fucking brand. But, <laughs> Uh, I think it's probably going to end up splitting, but I think what you're going to see happening, and we've had multiple examples of this already, where a guy is a hardcore red pill guy, he gets into an LTR, his girl steps out on him, and that relationship ends, mm. and then he's back to the red pill message. But I think it's kind of a natural cycle of things with men that, okay, it's okay to play the field, but then then you kind of get bored with the random hosts and you kind of settle down for a while and you enjoy that for a bit. And then you start to feel the itch and you eject from it. And I think it's a kind of a natural thing, but I'm more concerned with what's going to happen when one of these, one or more of these trad accounts who one, they're basing their income on it. Mm. Two, they all have the message of radical self ownership, so to speak, that everything that happens to you is your fault. Yes. And, Three, we know that divorce happens. So what's going to happen when a guy like that gets hit with a divorce? Yeah, yeah. Well, they always have the caveat, don't they, that she wasn't the right woman. You know, she was, she, I didn't vet her properly. That's always sort of the get out clause, isn't it? And, and then you, you might get somebody doing a mea culpa type thing and saying, oh, I hadn't, I clearly hadn't self-actualized enough. I hadn't built myself up enough as a man in order to, to pick the right woman. Because that's what... That's what some of these guys will say, isn't it? So this this is yeah, but to me to... that's ad hoc. Say again? It's ad hoc. Because it's an excuse that is for that purpose only to explain why something didn't work out the way that they thought it would work out. Yeah. Well, I, I, I... Is, you can take a girl, you can take the most perfect church girl, wife her up at 18, put three kids in her provide a good income, provide a nice house, provide a nice family life, and that girl may still step out on you. Yeah. Absolutely. It was that one girl side in Vegas when she had one too many Mai Tais and did some Coke. So yeah, everyone has that inherent risk. And you have to be aware that even the most traditional girl might have that little well, risk. 
exactly yeah and this is this has always been my point with this and this is what why what annoys me about these dudes because so the 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 sort of the the life coach dating coach angle on this that i'm seeing from the sort of purple pill guys let's say is is kind of like these red pill guys are really nihilistic they think that you know relationships and intimacy can't work and actually it can work and it does work in a lot of, ca of cases all you need to do is to firstly heal your trauma, to reach inside and heal your inner child and, and, and get, get right with yourself. And then you're gonna attract the right woman into your life who is gonna be, I suppose we'd say a, 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 new, a, a now old, you know, who's gonna be this amazing, perfect woman who, who isn't gonna act out on her hypergamy and um, you know, you're gonna have an amazing marriage and, and life. Now, that's always seemed to me incredibly problematic and actually really damaging potentially as well, because I think it leads just guys, guys in the wrong direction. It's almost like saying, well, OK, we've, we've, we've built up, we've amassed this, this body of knowledge over the last 10, 15 years in the red pill. But let's just forget all about that and pretend to turn the clock back and just pretend all of that stuff didn't come out or it doesn't count for some reason because we don't like Rollo, you know. Um, uh, uh, Morris Levy just made a comment here. Yeah. I actually addressed the SMP starting at 13. I have an essay on that, um, to quote Rolo. <laughs> uh, I can't remember the name of it, but yeah, it starts very early. Yeah. But it does kind of end at one point. I mean, you hit kind of a level where you're so low on the SMB totem pole as to be irrelevant. And men may have a resurgence in their... 60s 70s and 80s if they are in good shape because you have a lot of women who lose their husbands around 60 70 mm. and they come back on the market and they may want a partner but it's not going to be um it's not going to be a major issue and then you have smp starting at 13 i i think it might start sooner in some cases but i think it's around uh, 12, 13, where girls become aware of it. Men generally don't until they're 16, 17. Some never do in the SMP as a concept or a construct, rather. But, um, yeah, because I was looking at this the other day with when people lose their virginities. And women generally lose theirs before men. Okay. And that's generally because, like, let's say you're 15. The girls on your same level, they're going after guys who are 16, 17, 18. Mm. Same thing when you're 18. The girls are going after, you know, guys who are 20, 21, 22, 23. Whereas the guy who's 18, he's going after girls who are like 15, 16, 17. Uh, <clears throat> mm. At least in my experience, that way, that's what it looks like that Guys who are two to three uh, years old, guys are going two to three years younger. Girls are going uh, two to three years older. And let's see, sexual inflation. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by sexual inflation. I uh, think, is he, is he talking there about the sort of Instagram thing where a girl's getting a, a million likes every time she posts a picture and so she thinks that she's, you know, she, she's, she's better than the equivalent guys. Um, you know, in, in her sexual marketplace. Yeah, that could be that, but that's a, that's not in sexual inflation. I talked about that in one of my essays. I think it's called the uh, reflexivity and the sexual marketplace where girls are being drastically overvalued. So a female five feels like she's an eight. Mm. And mm. you have the girl the guy who's a an eight he feels like he's a six a five or six and he appears to be that in the market and sooner or later that's probably going to have to normalize to be more accurate with the right value yeah so, yeah because we do have this though the, even though the girl is getting a million likes on her instagram ass photos that finances her life. That's the beta buck side of things. That doesn't fix the alpha fuck side of things. It, no, it, it doesn't. But I can sort of see how it, it feel. It can feel to her, perhaps not necessarily long term, but for for a while, it can feel to her like her um, 
the, op- the the kind of dude that she can land is is higher than perhaps it actually is in reality. And I know that from my own personal experience because if I've been going out and doing a lot of so I've been going out and doing a lot of day games I had in the past, and I was getting a lot of really positive responses from girls. Then even if um, I wasn't actually I hadn't actually landed one of them yet. I would still feel this sense of inflation. I would still go around thinking, actually, I kind of am the shit because all these girls like me. So, and and it didn't matter that I, I hadn't got any tangible assets as a result of that. It was just that feeling of optimism. And I, I can see how that would play out with girls as well, just through their Instagram accounts and things. I'm not sure what he means by MMP here. Is it married marketplace? Possibly, yeah, mar- maybe marriage marketplace. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's shutting down by 31. I'd say it's kicking up at 31. Mm. Because the majority of marriages kick in at about um, 28, 29 for women. A little bit older for men. But I would argue that if it's the marriage marketplace, I'd say it, it ke- that it kicks on at about 25, 26. And then it has its major heyday between 26 and 36. Then you have a resurgence around 27, 30, uh, 38. Then it has another resurgence at 45, 46, because you have the divorces. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, marriage is obviously is obviously a uh, you know a, a problematic area, which we haven't we, we're not. I suppose we're not, we're not really talking so much today about the the specifics of marriage itself, are we? As much as um, as much as LTRs, oh, although <laughs> although I mean I don't know really. Do, 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 yeah, I mean I feel like we get a lot of flack for being fundamentally anti-LTR, but like rule zero is Rolo is married. Yeah. Ryan's in an LTR. Uh, I'm not quite sure what Rich's situation is at the moment. So we have guys that uh, make it work. Well, I, I mean, I, I have a girlfriend, at, uh, you know, and um, I, I, I'm certainly not, it's, you know, I, I, I'm certainly not somebody who has never had relationships. I'm certainly not somebody who has not, um, you know, explored that side of things because because i absolutely have i i think that um it's it's not i'm certainly not coming at it from this as, as they would say nihilistic sort of uh position where i'm sort of like oh, i can never work and just you know love is love is dead and this sort of michelle welbeck type um vision i mean you know it's just that clearly there are problems here and i think uh, i think the the, the trads and the um Purple pill guys just want to gloss over them and basically say, "Well, look, if you get your chakras aligned, and uh, you buy my my course for five hundred dollars, then it it could all be all right because these red pill guys just don't have the, these red pill, pill pill guys. Sorry, are broken, and so therefore they can't make relationships work for them. But you can, and that seems to me the biggest deception of all of them." Yeah, I would agree. And I think it's also, I, I'm going to steal something from the Tucker Max message boards back in the day. I think it was posted mm. by a dude that went by Sling Blade. And he said something like, if you haven't had a one night stand, by the time you're 30, you're missing out. You're lacking important life experience. If you haven't had a relationship lasting over one year, by the time you're 30, you're lacking vital life experience. Yeah. I think it goes both ways. You need to have all sorts of that full spectrum of experiences. But you have to be able to, um, in a way, not get caught up in having them. And uh, let's see here. Uh, Maurice lived We have an interesting discussion in chat here uh, about Mm -hmm. the marriage ages. And, you know, having kids without being married is not a thing in the U.S. Jesus Christ, do you even know what's going on in the black community? Do you even know the in cities you have cohabitation going on a lot more than marriages these days? And, Mm. you know, African tribes, you have have to view this from the perspective of average lifespan. In the West, our average lifespan is about 75 years, give or take. And we have much higher um, educational requirements or training requirements to get a decent job where you can actually afford to have a family. 
Mm, mm. So sensible people in the West are waiting longer simply because you have to do more groundwork. If you look at at least part of African tribes, uh, there's not a lot of things they have to do before they should start popping out kids, plus their life expectancy is shorter. And it's the same thing if you go back, well, let's say 50, 60 years in Europe in the US, and people were getting married in their late teens, early 20s, and, start, and had their kids by the time they were 25. So you yeah. were an empty nester at 40, 45, rather than 50, 55, as it is now. Mm. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you always have to look at that from a kind of a social perspective. Yeah, yeah. Here's another point, right? Um, which has always interested me. When I when I when I'm on Twitter, I have a very different experience of the way things are to when I'm actually out in the real world. And maybe it's just me. I mean, you, this is obviously a self-selecting thing, but. Um, the sorts of conversations that we see on Twitter with these trad guys sort of shaming dudes for sleeping around and sort of saying you're broken if you're not considering marriage by 30 and all this kind of stuff. I have literally never heard anybody saying that in the real world. So I, I, I just wonder how skewed the sphere is and how skewed in particular uh, Twitter is with this sort of echo chamber of these guys virtue signaling to one another in a way that just doesn't seem to reflect the real world. But then on the other hand, you know, you do read articles about, um, you know, Zoomers in particular being very conservative and, 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 you know, looking for more traditional structures. So I don't know, how reflective do you think it is? I think Twitter is Twitter and real life is real life. Yeah. I'm reminded of the whole, uh, you have a comic I saw a while back with like this short, tiny dude being like, I'm 6'2", I'm 220, pure muscle, I'm a black belt, and the fighting with, like, the yelling at this big dude, and it's like under, when you forget, you're not on the internet. Mm, mm. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in the uh, conversation when we had, like, the guy who's married, who's calculating his notch count with that one girl he's been with for 12 years. And it's... Yeah. I've never found Twitter to be very reflective of the world at all, because Twitter is all about the loudest voices and the people who tweet the most and the most extreme opinions get the most traction. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. So from my view, it's just like I've never had people and I've been in the States, I've been in Europe been in Asia, and I've never really seen anyone being up in arms about fucking Trump. In the in the States? Yeah, in real life. Like, I've yeah. never had someone pour a beer on a Trump supporter or some shit like that. Or, you know, <laughs> it, 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 no, but Twitter is like the most extreme side of things. The same thing as Facebook's the biggest echo chamber. Twitter is the biggest one-upsmanship. I mean, Twitter is to men what Instagram is for hoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like and you have like the same hundred people liking and retweeting you every time. So, oh, he's got a hundred retweets. Yeah, it's the same hundred guys that retweeted his last 3,000 posts. Yeah. So yeah. It's, for me, it's just ugh, I've started blocking everyone on Twitter who tweets about politics. And and if anyone mentioned Jesus when they're tweeting at me and it's out of context, I just block them too. <laughs> yes, it's incredible, really, the uh, the amount of people that that that, that do. Um, so obviously, you know, we're coming into a big year. It's election year in the states. Uh, Trump, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that you want to share. I mean, I, I, I you know, from where I'm sitting, I, I suspect it looks it's looking pretty like he's gonna he's gonna get it again and. Um, Obviously, in the run-ups to that, and, and this, this, the theory is that all of this traditionalism that we're seeing now is is in the run-up to that. It's sort of um, gilding the wheels, isn't it, for that election? But would you like to comment on that at all? No, oh, it clearly is. And I mean, and Trump has done a brilliant job making all these trads think that he's with them. Because, I mean, okay. look at Trump. He, he was like an urban, big city Democrat most his life. He's been married, what, six times He's cheated on every wife he has. He's Christian in name only. So it's kind of incredible that he's kind of the figurehead they picked to be the spearhead of their movement. Well, he's doing a great job playing them. 
It's it's mental. Yeah, I've I've always thought that. I mean, Trump is the least trad person I can probably think of, really. I mean, he's the, the complete opposite of that. And yet he's got all of these dudes, you know, under his spell. Um, uh, Same thing with Hillary, though. And like Hillary is like the least democratic person I know. She's been on every side of every issue. She's a millionaire. She has mansions. She has a I think she she's a Harvard grad. And she's been in politics her whole life. And she's like, I'm going to fix Washington. Well, why are you the most qualified? Because I helped ruin it in the first fucking place. Yeah. And so they're, they're both the, the same side of the same issue. And yet Trump is a degenerate playboy. He's been his entire life. And I don't really get why he's like the trad icon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, his 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 rhetoric and his messaging, I suppose, has been very clever, and I mean, he's um, you know, he, he's he's done very well. I mean, I I suppose it's similar in a way to to the to the fact that we have this event planner who is well known for his um earlier degeneracy, who's now leading the trads into uh, into glory at uh, you know various conferences ne uh, this year. Um, it's kind of like you know, it's it it's, it seems like in the end, if you say the right words. People don't seem to want to look that closely at what you did in the past. I mean, we have it with Boris here, Johnson here as well, to some extent. I mean, Boris is, has become the, the 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 figurehead for Levers, and he's now actually, and you know, and let's face it, very successfully, he's now won the election, and we're going to leave the European Union and, and everything else. But I, I'm still not convinced that he was ever a true Brexiter. Really, I was. I'm not convinced that he was a true Lever. I, I think, like a lot of people. Um, this is my suspicion is that he just marked, you know, put his money down on the on the color that he thought was most likely to come up, and he thought it was going to be leave, and it and it, it did, and so he won. You know, I don't, I'm not sure that he feels it in his in his in his heart like like some of these the more zealous people do, and I think, that, but people are happy to ignore that as long as the message that you're saying is is in a, is is correct. I think he's a political opportunist, but so is Trump, so was Hillary, so. And I'm not really sure which I'd rather pick, a competent opportunist or an incompetent idealist. Yeah, well, yeah, like Corbyn. So, yeah, so I'd rather, I'd rather have someone who's competent and can get things done because, quite frankly, Boris would never have been elected if Labour hadn't fucked themselves over for two, three years. Mm. trying to go against the popular vote because pe I think people got in the great English sense they got so annoyed with having to see Brexit that they were like fuck it we'll vote Boris in that way we can get this shit over with and we can <coughs> move on with our day yeah yeah I'm just tired of hearing about it and then same thing I mean I'm tired of hearing about Trump. I'm tired of hearing about Brexit. I'm, I'm just tired generally about politics because it's, it's just a dog and pony show. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. So if, assuming that Trump does win again, do you think that's going to embolden the, the, the traditionalists? Uh, or do you think it's just all going to dissipate again a little bit after, after the election? I don't know. So I think the whole the destruction of the sphere started with the Trump election. Yeah. And I think once that's over with and that period is over, I think that might kind of take it down a notch, provided that it also takes the social thing down a notch because i think that's the major driver here because i've, I've made notes prior to going on here that yeah. if we take the three areas i think most relevant let me find my notes here i obviously put my notepad here yeah i put down three areas economic political and social mm. and from an economic perspective people are still encouraging like the boomer slash trad lifestyle you have incentives yeah. to get married. You have incentives to have kids. It's sort of tax write-offs, blah, blah, blah. Politically, there's no politician that's saying, go out there and fuck like rabbits, but make sure you use protection. Which but is a shame. Politicians see that you need to have a huge population to have economic power. 
because the bigger your population, the more economic leverage and more political leverage you have versus other countries. Hmm. And then we have the social sphere where the fighting is really going on because it's about really about having a control over the social space. And, you know, the leftists, they want this whole political correctness shit where uh, nothing is true and everything is permitted to um, mm. misquote Smerdyakov. And then you have the right who's like, no, we need to reinstitute uh, 18th century Puritanism. <laughs> and then you have the people in the middle who are getting more and more disconnected and yeah. are just kind of focused on getting things done. Because quite frankly, most of us just want things to get done in an efficient manner, I think. Yeah, yeah. And the problem is the people in the middle are not giving a shit. And the people on the edges are getting more and more agitated. So in the end, you have like Paul Elam screaming at some chick with purple hair. What will be the most popular fashion style? I think I would never dress like Drake. But no matter how you dress, you won't look as ridiculous as Kanye in 2009. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's what I'm channeling today. Um, I think that I, I put this one up because uh, Cole, uh, Cole's asked this uh, this a few times in the chat. Um, but I'm not sure really. I mean, all of them could be good. I, I personally, of, of the three, I would say Drake style is the one I would recommend least because it works for Drake because he's a multimillionaire or whatever rapper. Um, but it's a pretty basic style. Do you know what I mean? Like, I would rather go for... And actually, I do flip between the other two. So sometimes, I mean, Rockstar is, is over-egging the pudding a little bit. But I go for a leather jacket kind of maybe ripped jeans type look sometimes. Or I'll go for something that's a bit more suited and very sort of kind of formal or, or looking. You know, I think those two archetypes are good. I think Drake style... I wouldn't recommend it. I don't think I could pull it off because I, th I, I feel like, again, it's, it's all down to sort of you, you want to go in there and you want to create an impact and you create more of an impact with the other two. I think if you go in like Drake and you're just wearing some baggy sweater or something, it's not really, if you haven't got the money and the fame to back it up, I'm not really sure what you're saying with those outfits, you know? That's just me though. I mean, it depends what your style is and it depends your social circle, you know, the kinds of girls that you're going for and so on and so forth. That, that would be my take on it anyway. Well, I'm thinking back to, I think it was a Grammy Award like 10 years ago. Mm. I'm kind of dating myself here. And Kid Rock showed up wearing suit pants, a wife beater, a flip-flops, and a fedora. Mm. And that's kind of the fuck you, I'm rich and famous look. Yeah. Everyone else yeah, is yeah. in a suit. He's there like in flip-flops. Yeah. And I think I think it just... It helps to have a certain degree of flexibility with your appearance. Mm, mm, yeah. Be able to dress well in degrees of formal. Like you don't have to wear like a golden tux, but at least know how to get a suit that fits you, have shoes, make sure your belt and your shoes match, make sure your medals match, that type of thing. Because you can get a far away with just doing that. And, you know, good ties, good pocket square. Know when you need to skip the tie in the pocket square. Know when to have them. In yes. some level of street style, 98% of the time. And at that point, don't get, you know, extremely embroidered. Get regular, well-fitting, and looks look good. You can go with various washes. You can go maybe with some tears on them, whatever. It depends on what you're going for in terms of a look. Leather jackets are always a win. Yeah, I'm a big, uh, yeah, big fan of leather jackets. I think, I mean, that was actually, funnily enough, in London, that was the day game, the so-called day game uniform for a long time. Dudes would, because um, Tom Torero and uh, I think Nick Krauser as well used to wear a leather jacket and je tight jeans and boots. That became the the. Um, the uniform that all these guys were wearing, and you'd walk up and down Oxford Street, and you'd see all these guys in these identical leather jackets and jeans and boots going up and talking to, to girls. And uh, by the way, somebody was asking about Tom Torero earlier in the chat. Um, he is, um, he's fine. Um, he's taking some time out. Um, I'm not sure what his future, his future plans are, but he is, uh, I, I spoke to him 
just before Christmas. He's well, um, doing a bit of traveling, I think, uh, as I say, taking some time out. And yeah, he's he, all, all, is, all is good with him. And um, I'm sure there'll be new, more news on that um, in due course. But, um, but yeah, I think fa fashion is... People, people sometimes say, have asked me about fashion and they've said, oh, can you create some content on style and fashion and stuff? And I quite like to because it's something I find really interesting. But at the same time, I've always sort of resisted it because I, I'm not really, I don't consider myself an expert. Well, obviously, <laughs> but I don't consider myself an expert in it unless it's for me. It's sort of like I, I don't, I couldn't ever see myself doing a Tana Guzzi type thing where I'm recommending stuff for other dudes because I think it depends very much on your personal style and what you're trying to say. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, it, well, style is inherently to some degree personal. Mm. I mean, a suit is going to be like, with the type of work I do, I'm in a suit a lot of the time. Yeah. So I'm extremely comfortable in a suit. And then I see with some of the, the guys I know who never wear one except for, you know, formal occasions, they look inherently uncomfortable wearing a suit. Mm. And I think that mm. goes to, you know, what you're used to wearing, what you feel good wearing, what suits your personality. Yeah. And it could not, not just your default personality, but like a given personality within a context. Like if you're in corporate, you should know how to wear a suit, for instance. You kind of have to. Mm. So mm. I think it's just about adaptability and just try things out and see what you like to some extent without making some of the... Uh, my main thing for dressing better is just uh watch well-built style he used to have some kind of like average guy style or something like that he would put up and my main thing is you just don't end up in one of well-built styles pictures of you know average guy style and just don't get called out by him on twitter for fucking your style up <laughs> yeah. yeah which i probably will after this um Cole Snow said, you've got advice or experience with your seduction success rate and what you were wearing at the time. Well, I, I will say one thing on this. Um, when I was working in corporate uh, and I was wearing a suit or at least a suit jacket and a shirt and trousers, and I would go out and do uh, some day game approaches after that, I found the results to be better than when I was, say it was the summer and then the rest of the time I'm going out in jeans and a t-shirt because it's really hot. I found my results to be better when I'm wearing the suit. Um... So I would say that um, I think actually if you can if you're comfortable in a suit and you can look good in a suit I think that actually there is still you know girls respond quite well to that um, but whether it's better than a leather jacket I don't really know because you're playing a different archetype there then you're playing the bad boy rock star type character and if you've got tattoos and stuff that can look really cool um, it, I, th I think that I think rather than thinking what better and thinking one is defin right if i wear this i'm going to get laid more and if i wear this i'm going to get laid less and how does it all correlate on a spreadsheet i think you need to think in terms of archetypes and think okay so what what do i want to project when i when i go into this girl when i go sorry when i go in and speak to this girl and then dress according to that but i think and i think actually tana says this as well um what I always think about with clothes is power. You want to be somehow communicating power with your clothes. Now, by that, I don't mean you have to dress like Donald Trump. Um, actually, in fact, don't do that. that. That would be really bad. But what what you need to do is 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 sort of somehow project that you are powerful within your own archetype. So if you're the rock star dude, look like the rock star dude. Look like look look badass. You know, look like you look like you mean it. If you are the um, and I was advising a client recently, actually, who was a who was a, a finance guy who works in Canary Wharf here in London. And I was saying to him, if I were you, I would really play up the Wolf of Wall Street city boy bad boy look because he kind of had it going on anyway. And I was saying, you know, you want to play that shit up because that plays into an archetype. You become a fantasy for her. You become the 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 the, the stand in Leonardo DiCaprio in that movie for her. And that's what you want to be doing. You want to be thinking, okay, what am I triggering in this girl when I walk up to her? Um, so that's how I that's how I tend to go about it. But I always want to look like I kind of look I kind of want to look like I mean it when I'm wearing the clothes. If that makes any sense, you know, I want to I want to I want to make an impression. I want to look like I'm you know I, I'm the real deal in whatever I'm wearing. Yeah, David D'Angelo talked about this with congruency back in one of his programs from like the early two thousands. <laughs> that don't look like you're cosplaying. And that was my interpretation. But if you look like you're cosplaying a rock star, 
it's not yeah. going to work. I remember I was in Prague, I think, at one point, and I think uh, our uh, real Real Social Dynamics was doing a workshop at the same time because I was sitting at an outdoor cafe just having a pint, and suddenly I see like 20 guys coming up the street. Everyone's in black jeans, black boots, black leather jacket. Yeah. And I was like, okay, fuck this. I'm out. <clears throat> mm, mm. Well, again, you know, you need to find little ways to stand out. And I think details are really important. So people, you know, we talked about pocket squares and things like that. I mean, jewelry and rings and things like that is, you know, it's, it's the old peacocking stuff um, that goes back to mystery and beyond. But um, I think it's good to have a little bit of an edge, you know, and, and, and that can come through in detailing. I mean, like you don't have to wear a gold jacket, but it's probably good. To, to brighten up a jacket with like a little pocket square or something like that, just to just to just to give yourself a little bit of an edge. So try not to, basically try not to look like everybody else. Try to have something a little bit different about you. Um, you should because that because clothing in the end clothing amplifies your personality. It's, it tells a story about your personality, and you need to be playing into that. Not just wearing something because you quite like green and you saw it on sale in, in, in Primark or something, you know, you need to, you need to have a, you need to sort of, sort of have a reason why you're wearing things. You need to be attempting to create an impression in my view. Well, to be honest with you, I, I have some clothes. I like, I have a, a forest green sweat. And the only reason I wear that is because my eyes tend to shift colors uh, depending on what I'm wearing. Mm. Mm. So if I'm, I'm wearing forest green, my eyes look kind of green. If I wear something deep blue, my eyes look deep blue. If I'm wearing baby blue, they look uh, light blue, etc. So it, I kind of try and play that up based on the gaze I want to have. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good idea. That's a really good point. So look, I mean, we're coming up on two hours, more or less now. Um, I mean, I think I'm correct in saying a lot of your stuff in terms of dating a lot of your stuff is is around your you, you use the apps a lot don't you i think i'm correct in saying that yeah i actually i did day game i've done night game but i just found that i was able to get a certain level of consistency that was higher like the volatility was less when using apps and that's just yeah. because you can get a much higher um lead count going in quick because with day game you can only talk to one girl at a time. With an app, you can talk to 10 different girls at a time. Yeah, I, and, yeah. So that was always my, and I always used all three, and I think you kind of should. If, like, if you should be comfortable approaching a girl in the market or in the streets. You should be comfortable with the apps, and you should be comfortable you know, at a club or pub or whatever, or at a party for that sake, just because you kind of want those keep those leads coming in. Mm, mm. I would I would absolutely agree with that, and I've been a, an exponent for a long time of what I've called holistic game, which is um, basically exactly that. So basically, do a bit of day game, do a bit of night game, and have the apps going at the same time. Because because why not? Because all those things are are lead sources. All you're doing through that is, is getting leads into your pipeline. And then you're going into text game or messaging game. And then you're seeking to get them out, put, you know, the, some of these girls out on a date. Now, there's going to be a lot of attrition between the stages. So you might as well just use all the avenues that are open to you. Um, so I've certainly never been. I mean, you know, like Tom Torero was a, was a, was a day gamer. I, I've never been a day game purist. Um, it's certainly something I've done a lot of. And um and I've taught and so on, but um, I think ideally you should be using a bit of every a bit of everything really because because why not? You know, all you're doing is establishing. All your job is to go out and is establish as many contacts as you can, um, and then seek to move those through a funnel where I suppose the end of the funnel is is, is sex or a relationship. You know, that's what you want to be doing. Um, and how they come into the funnel is it sort of doesn't matter necessarily as long as they're coming through. But um, I just wanted to end by saying, obviously, coming into 2020, I mean, do, do you see the marketplace changing this year on the apps? Do you see things getting harder, getting easier? What, would you have any advice for guys who are out there in the field? What's your what's your general sort of temperature test on things? Well, I would look if there are new apps with a unique selling proposition coming in. Like when Happen came out, that's one of my favorite apps. 
because Tinder is just who's within a range. Happen mm -hmm. tracks people who have the app that were close to you at a given point. Yeah, yeah. So the good thing with that is if you're in a busy club, you can't possibly hit up every chick who was in the club that night. But yeah. you can have them logged on, have many of them logged on happen so you can swipe them later. Or if you're yeah. passing through like a busy intersection, like a central station or something, you can get a lot of leads in that way. You can do your swiping afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I, what I think is going to change though, I think a lot of girls are starting to come because I noticed that last year that a lot of girls were trying to leverage things like Tinder happen and the apps into relationships. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You still get quite a lot of casual sex on there, but there are a lot more relationship-minded girls in there. So I do advise that people have um, something like a good disarming line for things like, what are you looking for? Are you here for a relationship? And be very mindful of what vibe you're putting out with your uh, whole thing. Because there are... I think that was kind of the strange thing because Tinder has a reputation as a hookup app, mm. but it's basically becoming more of something like an OK Cupid for millennials. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I think Tinder's value is going to drop for people who are looking for casual sex and is not in that like top 20% bracket mm. because Tinder is brutal. And it's like I read an article. I I got my Tinder score from Tinder, and why I wish I hadn't, or something like that, because the guy figured out how attractive like a couple of thousand women thought it was. Hmm. So <laughs> I just keep that in mind, and just keep other avenues open, because if you're looking for casual sex, I think it's probably a better bet. Well, at least starting to be to go to the clubs. Go hit on the drunk girls. Hmm. Mm. Um. Yeah. No. Uh, good point. Um. I'll just address this one here quickly from Brandon. Living in a large European city, I'm ha having a hard time finding good areas for day game that aren't filled with club promoters and being confused with by women for them. What are some good general places? Well, I think it's really the obvious places, isn't it? I mean, I think it's the shop. I think it's the shopping malls. I think it's the busy shopping streets. I mean, in London, it's it's Oxford Street. Um. There's the Golden Triangle in London of Oxford Street, Leicester Square, Piccadilly Circus. Um, you know, in Prague, there's that famous uh, shopping street. I forget the name of it. I mean, there's there's the Kudam in Berlin, if you're there. I mean, I think it's just basically where is where is there going to be the most traffic? Now, yes, there are going to be occasions where you might be mistaken for a, a club promoter or somebody, you know, trying to get money for charity or, or one of those kinds of things. But you've just got to rake the numbers up. I mean, you know, that's not going to... And if that's happening a lot, then maybe there's something about your vibe that's coming over slightly wrong. Maybe you're coming over as a bit salesy or as a, you know, something like that. But in general, you, you know, you, you've just got to roll with the punches and rack the numbers up. That may happen sometimes, but, you know, you go in there with good posture, with good demeanor, with good eye contact. You approach a girl and that spark is ignited. She's not going to be thinking that you're a club promoter. You know, you've also got to make sure when you go in, by the way, that you are sexualizing the interaction that you are making your intent clear that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to go full mode one and say oh, i'm stopping you because i want to have, engage in coitus with you in the next 24 hours and be be that direct about it but you want to make it known by you know you go and say hey i, I saw you i think you look really cute i just wanted to say blah 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 and even if you go in indirect you want to make it clear from your posture and your eye contact that you're interested in her you know um but yeah, I you know I wouldn't worry about that too much. I just you just need to rack up the numbers, man. I think I think that's the answer. Okay, so I got an interesting question in chat, Carl. So you think girls are getting more relationship oriented? No, I don't. What I think is happening is uh, part of it is deep denial of over what Tinder really is, and part of it is girls that started out with Tinder as a way to hook up, who are now starting to hit their epiphany phase. And I think it's also a good way to make Tinder more clean in a sense, in that it's going to be more acceptable among women to use Tinder if they think, oh, well, everyone's going to believe I'm on here for a relationship. Because it's kind of been common practice for girls to kind of put 
oh, I'm here for a relationship, no players or no bad boys or whatever. And that's mm. kind of been, I've always thought of that in case their brother or their father's friend or something sees them on Tinder. Mm. It's kind of a deflection or plausible deniability. And I think girls are kind of getting into the vibe where they kind of want to increase that plausible deniability that they're still there for hookups. But if they find something of high value, I think they'd uh, go for that too. So it's it kind of that kind of uncomfortable thing. Like you had the same thing with bars and nightclubs back in like the early to mid 2000s where suddenly girls were looking for relationships in bars and nightclubs. Mm. And I think it's mm. just a running game for women to make things plausible and uh, to have that plausible deniability. Mm. And it's the uh, same thing with the chick who's like, I have four boyfriends and I'm uh, pregnant now. I think it just comes down to something as simple as that. The girls just want to have all their options open. And Tinder is a great way for them to kind of find those high value guys and try and lock them down. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a, an element of look at what she does, not what she says with this. So she might say, that that's what she's looking for and maybe it is maybe it isn't but but look at the other indicators you know how quickly does she respond how quickly can you get her out for a can you transition her to whatsapp how quickly will she come out for a drink then when you go out for a drink with her what are the vibes you're getting off her in real life does she seem like somebody who's here to you know um or, or, or are you getting a bit of a vibe that actually you know something could happen tonight and if if you are then steer things in that direction and just you know, regardless of what she may have said on her profile and see where things go. Because, um, because yeah, you have to bear in mind that the, what people say and what they actually want to do in the moment are, can be two very different things. Never trust what people say. Trust what they do. People can say whatever they want. They don't tend to do things that they... Exactly. Exactly. Okay, well, look, um, we're, we've past the two hour mark now it's been absolutely awesome to to chat carl it's been really great to have you on um oh yeah it was great to be on i'm just sorry we went veered off into that political shit for about 15 minutes no that's Hard all right to avoid, I mean, though, when you're talking about the uh 2020 vision on the sexual marketplace since those things are so intermingled right now well i think that's yeah i mean i was kind of aiming for that in a way i don't want to bang on about politics too much but it's kind of um it, it, you know, all of these things are interrelated, aren't they, at the end of the day? And it's, it's interesting to just, just take an aerial view of, of how it all might fit together. But, um, I mean, for me, all I would say is, look, I think there are challenges out there. I think, you know, things aren't necessarily easy. Things in the sexual marketplace may not be as, as you want them to be. But there are also just massive opportunities out there, right? I mean, there are also, you know, and 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 everything is out there the game is there to be played and everything is out there you know you can have an incredible life now with the opportunities that we have so i i go forward into this new decade with uh, you know with optimism really well apart from the, the news this morning but you know putting world war three aside I, I go into this decade with optimism because i just think there is so much that that we can achieve and, and you've got all of the tools out there at your disposal so really need to just go out there and you know grasp life by the by the balls and and just and run with it really yeah, so last comment, and I know I've said that like four times now. I find it hard to go off these shows, but last question. We see the rise of day game, then the rise of Tinder game. Now, what's the next rise? Last question. That's going to be social media game, definitely. It's going to be basically guys cultivating Instagram profiles, Snap profiles, etc., and using that as their main funnel. Because we, we're yeah. already seeing that sort of. But it's not really caught on too much with guys. I mean, women are all over Instagram as a means of image marketing. And I think we're going to see a lot of guys trying to cultivate good Instagram profiles specifically to funnel girls into their dating life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, as you say, I mean, I think that's happening to some extent already. But but um, but yeah, you can only see you can only see it moving further in that direction. And actually, of all people, George Bruno tweeted about that the other day, didn't he? He said he said it's likely that you'll meet your next partner on a um, a social media app rather than a dating app. And you know, maybe he had um, maybe he had a good point there. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think know. I don't read George Bruno's Twitter feed. 
I'm not. I, 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 I haven't bookmarked him. Put it that way, but I happened to see that. Um, I did happen to see that tweet. But um, but yeah, I mean, I, I like I said before. I mean, I, I think in the end, your job as a, if you're a guy who's going out to to get laid or even to find a relationship, your job is to is to create as many opportunities for yourself as you can, and you do that by amassing leads. And the way, and, and there are a, a myriad of ways. Well, there are not a myriad. There are a number of ways to amass leads, and one of them is social media. You know, um, without a doubt, and certainly Instagram, Snapchat. I don't use as much at the moment, but certainly, in, certainly Instagram. I mean, yeah, for sure. So you want to be using all of the, the the avenues open to you to get more girls into your into your pipeline, and then after that, you know, you weed out the ones who aren't interested, and you take it further with the ones who are. You know. It, and rinse and repeat, and that's how it goes. So, th and there's there are more and more opportunities to do that across different platforms every day. So, we live in a great time for degeneracy, I think, Carl. Oh, we most definitely do. I mean, I just saw that. Uh, if you haven't checked that out, by the way, you can check out the most searched for things on Pornhub by country. I did have a look at that actually. I did have a look at that. This is interesting. Plus, you know, always look at what sex toys are selling because that tells you what people are interested in. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. I noticed there was a little bit of an uptick in um, in interest in cuck porn amongst um, eighteen to twenty four year olds. But as people rightly pointed out, it didn't say what the baseline figure was, so you, you can't tell if it was a really small group. But um, but no, it's interesting that the Zoomers are into into cuck porn apparently, which is um, food for thought. Perhaps That's very another. interesting. I mean, I, I didn't think um, trad Twitter would have that much of a real life impact. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Their reach is, 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 is bigger than we think. Um, yeah. So look, anyway, let's let's call it for, for today's show. It's been, as I say, it's been awesome having you on. And I think we've, we've had a really great conversation about, you know, some of the trends and the way things might go forward into next, into this year. But um, where can people find you and what are you what are you because you, you've, you've sort of taken a little bit of time out of the scene I, I guess over the last few months what, what's your what are you up to now and where can people find you and what should they look out for well i am doing rule zero tomorrow with uh i think it's going to be ryan yourself and uh, i think everyone else was like we have better things to do so uh, <laughs> be an interesting conversation mm. and then um I'm also always trying to create new content, but I've written some 200 essay and a couple of books. I'm not sure how much I have left in me to write about this topic. It's uh, kind of hard to come up with new things. You don't want to end up being like the guy who repeats yourself for five years. And then mm. there's always my Twitter feed if you want some comedy and making fun of trans and taking the piss out of people's kids. Yeah, those beautiful pictures they take in the woods where it's sort of sepia tinged and the 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 you know and then and then they always put something underneath the picture of the kids, don't they? Say, so you might be, you're just about to embark on your three hundredth notch, but you could be when you could be having this. And then there's a picture of the kids, and it's like, it you'll never empty the hole in your soul, you know. And it's 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 this sort of like hallmark card kind of mentality, isn't it? That's. Yeah, and it's also, I love the whole thing, you know, like, I'm teaching my kid how to ride his bicycle. And it's like, okay, you're supposed to do that. Why is that exciting? Why is that a cool thing to do as a dad? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, here, here are me and the guys out at the range in the woods learning to protect our families. It's like, look, my wife let me go to the shooting range with my buddies. She even said I could have two and a half familiar lights. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. It's uh, it's the parody of a parody, but um, but yeah, good stuff. So follow uh, Carl Black Label Logic on Twitter because his Twitter feed is incredibly entertaining. Um, his blog is fantastic as well. I'll link to it below. I read the last essay, by the way. That was um, I really enjoyed reading that. It's good to see you. It's good to see you back um, with that with that long form piece of content. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, obviously, please do uh, subscribe to this channel and hit notifications so you'll see when. New content is coming out. I'm uploading content pretty much daily during the week on this channel now. So, so do um, do hit subscribe. It really helps to spread the word. Uh, get on my daily email list. I send out an email Monday to Friday, free article to your inbox. Uh, the link is below. And if you're interested in reading my musings on dating and the sexual marketplace um, and game and all of that good stuff, 
then do click the link below for Renegade Dating Blueprint, which is my 10 book bundle. You can get it for just $39 at the moment, leaving it up for, for the moment uh, due to popular demand. Full value really is $250. I could be charging for, for all of those things combined. So it is a great deal. Do click the link below, get those books before that gets taken down. And yeah, I will leave it until we speak again. Uh, great to see you, Carl. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us and we will see you again very soon. Bye-bye.